So now um, <clears throat> I would like to invite the speakers to join me on the podium, starting with uh, Amina Hawala, who uh, will speak about the coalition, then uh, Cesare Atwiri, uh, who will speak about establishing interregional and global partnerships, if you'd like want to join here, uh, Wilbur Sabiti, for streamlining disease surveillance across Africa, um, then Lauren, who just landed, uh, Lauren Hockham, uh, on the importance of context-specific prevention and control strategies, followed by Luisa and Ria on interdisciplinary methods, and uh, then Brenda, who will open the floor for the next steps. Thank you very much. And with no further delay, I would like uh, to invite Amina Hawala to come on the podium for her talk. Dr. Amina Hawala has over 10 years experience in public and global health. As a clinical scientist, she worked in the development of new anti-malarial treatments at the University of Geneva in collaboration with the National Institute of Public Health Research of Mali and at the Product Development Partnerships Medicines for Malaria Venture. She was also involved in the development of new therapeutics for the treatment of cancer and infectious diseases at the Biofarm. She graduated as a pharmacist from the University of Geneva and has a PhD in clinical pharmacology from the University Hospital of Lausanne. The floor is yours, Amina. Thank you. Can you hear me? Does it work? Thank you very much, Natalie, for your kind introduction, and thank you all for attending our side event. Um, I'm very pleased to present today challenges and proposed solutions for LMIC to drive collaborative research during pandemics. And many of the thoughts and issues I will present have been raised by our membership and working groups. Um, can we see the slides? Yes, thank you so much. So the COVID pandemic is an ongoing global health crisis with devastating consequences worldwide. And in, it has revealed inequities between low and high resource settings in access to diagnosis, prevention, and treatments. And the COVID Clinical Research Coalition was created in April 2020 with the mission to advocate and collaborate for the advancement of COVID research driven by the needs of people in low resource settings to strive for equitable access to solutions in the global response to the pandemic and to promote open sharing of data and knowledge. And I'm going to use these three pillars uh, from our mission as basis for this presentation and describe challenges and solutions for each of them. Okay. So I'll start presenting challenges to leverage global expertise for high-impact clinical research. Uh, in the COVID clinical studies landscape, there has been inadequate geographical representation of LMIC. You can see here on the map showing COVID-funded research project up to September 2022 that most of the studies, it's even more than 80%, were done in high-income countries, uh, especially in North America and the UK. Also, the clinical research response to COVID has not been very well coordinated. There's been a large number of trials registered and done with questionable methodological quality, with lack of evidence-based prioritization of new candidates. And there's also been multiplication of underpowered heterogeneous studies with little impact. There's also been lack of community-centered approaches with the exclusion of community and patients from research, from decision making process. And there's been lack of transparency on R&D funding to secure public trust and to demonstrate that both funders and funding recipients are accountable for R&D investment and also to create sustainability. In terms of challenges in access, so there has been lack of affordable, available, adaptable interventions to healthcare system in LMIC and in the population they serve. 
high-income countries were the main initial recipients of life-saving COVID vaccine, for example. Low-resource regions experienced substantial delay in access. Also, patents and IP, stringent IP protection in the pharma industry are a substantial barrier to access. And within the coalition, the social science working group made a call for an urgent TRIPS waiver to facilitate COVID vaccine equity. They believe the TRIPS waiver would make it easier for governments to address IP challenges and get freedom to operate, to create space for greater development and production of tools. But even with the TRIPS waiver, some of the healthcare system are weak and have a low capacity in supply chain and manufacturing, which would act as an additional obstacle to access. The, the COVAX initiative was set up to procure and deliver sufficient COVID vaccines to, so that every country gets fair access to vaccines, but it didn't meet its target for vaccine supplies and has shown that the charity model for vaccine equity does not work. Initial donation through COVAX proved to be insufficient and not sustainable, falling short on its original targets in vaccine supply. Another challenge I'd like to mention is has been low representation of researchers from LMIC in partnerships such as the ACT-A Therapeutics Partnership. This is one of WHO pillars um, of the WHO Access to COVID Tools Accelerator that aim to develop, manufacture and distribute COVID therapeutics. And the coalition advocated to increase a representation of researchers from LMIC in this work stream. But a recent external evaluation of this initiative by Open Consultant recognized that LMIC governments were ins insufficiently included in this model, which resulted in lack of ownership, lack of representation, and inequity in delivery of COVID tools. And moving to the challenges related to the last pillar of data sharing, um, there's been a lack of data sharing uh, and knowledge sharing in scientific research that has led to duplication and hindered the development of effective uh, therapeutics and, and, and vaccines. There's also been lack of metrics to support the value of data sharing and of reusing data to drive changes in the scientific community culture to, um, that would ultimately improve intervention effectiveness and public health. Also, when if moving to collaboration, uh, there's been lack of global and collaboration and coordination that has been recognized and has not allowed to achieve a coherent research response and to ensure sufficient context-specific research. Uh, LMIC are still not enough included, and MRC researchers are not enough included in decision-making with the underlying prejudice of lack of worthiness of researchers from LMIC, both in global health institution in high income countries, but also this also exists amongst LMIC institutions. So this makes echo to the current call to decolonize global health and highlights the importance of decolonizing people's minds as well. Moving to the solutions, uh, I'll start with the first pillar of accelerating clinical research that is driven by the needs of people from low resource settings. Um, COVID has made abundantly clear that uh, the evidence generated by high quality clinical trials is essential to respond effects effectively to emerging global health threats. So one solution would be to implement large publicly funded adaptive platform trials that are sufficiently powered, that ensure ensure inclusivity and rational choices of medicine. There's also a need for targeted, high-quality research led by scientists and clinicians in resource-limited settings to answer urgent questions of relevance in those settings. For example, the coalition working groups develop their own priorities, such as development of biobanking in LMIC by the virology, immunology, and diagnostic working groups, or study of post-COVID condition by the clinical epidemiology working group, etc. Research that is led by scientists from LMIC is needed to formulate important research questions that identify contextually adapted needs and priorities. Also, patient and communities should be integrated 
in the design and conduct of research, to build trust, involving community in research, would ensure research priorities are identified from the needs of the community, to build mutual trust, and show respect to those, those who are primarily affected by research results. Involving uh, vulnerable and underrepresented groups will allow them to benefit from research advances. Increasing diversity in research is important for reducing the unequal burden of disparities in healthcare. Also, we should ensure more effective coordinated funding to allocate funds transparently to well-designed, adequately powered clinical trials that are asking important research questions. Transparency of R&D costs could be a requirement for regulatories, for example. Regarding access, so one solution is to build resilient and diverse manufacturing capacity and infrastructure to increase production and distribution capacities. There's a need to scale up global manufacturing to diversify supply, to ensure sufficient production, equitable allocation, and affordable pricing. And also, capacity building for R&D in LMIC is key to ensure equitable partnership in research. Global health institutions should support the development the development of this capacity in LMIC and um, also it's important to advocate for greater support and commitment to the health sector from governments and research institu institutions from LMIC to increase their budgetary allocation to healthcare. Establishing needs-driven innovative ecosystem in which health priorities from all regions get adequate attention is really key. That requires building local and regional innovation networks and capacity across different actors with true collaboration and ownership by local experts and researchers. We should ensure that vulnerable, underrepresented groups get a benefit from research and that health tools are made public. Also, equitable access must really be deeply embedded in the R&D process. Access to diagnostics, vaccine and treatments should be thought in advance. And lastly, regarding promotion of open sharing of data and knowledge, a living systematic review was developed by IDO, the Infectious Diseases Data Observatory, and supported by the coalition. So this is uh, available on our website. It's a review of the registered clinical trials from around the world in an open access database that is frequently updated. And this is an interesting tool for researchers uh, to identify the ongoing trials so that they can avoid duplication and spot knowledge gaps. Another aspect is to promote publication of all data, regardless of the results, positive or negative, and uh, release it with the creation of data repositories. So the coalition um, made freely available a clinical research protocol repository that is available on our website. Also, funder could facilitate data, data sharing by having a ma mandate of sharing anonymized data as a requirement for funding. In terms of collaborative approaches, as the pandemic is a global problem, it requires global solutions involving international cooperation and collaboration. True transfer of technology and power and equitable partnership are important to strengthen existing research institutions and researchers in LMIC to identify the tools that are most appropriate and effective in these contexts. Cooperation would enable sharing of experience, sharing of resources, which can lead to more efficient conduct of research and better inform the agendas. We should include researchers from LMIC in priority setting and decision making in order to formulate important research questions by identifying contextually adapted needs and priorities. Another suggestion is to increase interdisciplinary research networks and collaboration to drive research in pandemics to build consensus around an architecture that can respond more effectively to the next pandemic. So promoting a culture of humble and constructive collaboration would greatly improve the outcome of clinical research. And 
In conclusion, I'd like to say that international coalitions and network representing the need of people from low resource settings and promoting a culture of sharing can pave ways for more equity and efficiency in clinical research and better access to health tools. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Amina. I think it was a very great introduction into uh, the discussion we would like to have on partnerships and collaboration. Just to see if there are any clarification questions for Amina. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Dr. Alan from Germany. I have been working in the um, academia for more than 18 years in the preclinical antiviral drug development. And currently, I have been also conducted some clinical trials, phase one and phase two, but I didn't reach to three or uh, maybe approval stage. Uh, I have one curiosity. If you go for FDA clinical trials website and if you try to find what kind of a clinical trials have been conducted and what are the transparent data published or unpublished. So I see more than 80% or maybe 75 to 80% clinically clinical trials conducted was either terminated or it was discontinued or it was still in the recruitment stage. So why it is like that? I mean 75 to 80% clinical trials who, which were already conducted, their data is not transparent. Either they are hiding or maybe it was negatively evaluated or maybe there could be some other reasons. So maybe you can tell, even in COVID-19 there are several. And we also know very well that any kind of a drug or vaccine they have to compete to all among and then only 1 to 2 percent has to be approved finally. 98 percent has to be discontinued or this has to be disapproved. You know, so this we know. But why the clinical trial data is not transparent or published or is it a hidden or what? Thank you so much. So that's a very good point. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, thank you for the, this point. Um, so I'm going to answer and tell you that I've spent some years in the pharma industry, for example, where secrecy is really the culture there, still, I think, unfortunately. And I remember that we were not allowed to share any of the negative data because of bad publicity, for example and maybe not, I don't know, not getting funding or for, for next project, but I think this is a reality. We know that developing treatments is complicated and we know that most projects in the end will, will not go through phase three and then registration. This is a reality, but it's so important, as you said, to share these negative trials and so that we don't duplicate efforts. It's so important and we need to change, I believe, honestly, this is my, my uh, personal view, that we need to change this whole cult culture of data sharing amongst all of us, all researchers, not only in the pharma industry. I'm pointing the pharma industry here, but I think this is va valid everywhere, you know. I know also in academics, some researchers are not keen to share data, want to keep them so that they're sure they can publish, you know, there are some, yeah, it's whole culture that needs change and I think raising awareness on that is one thing, but then developing tools to promote sharing and as we do on our website, for example, where we try to share as much data as we can on protocols, you know, and yeah, I think this should continue. We should continue this effort and really change the culture and also um, we can have uh, develop more data to show how important it is and how it makes uh, uh, the research more efficient in the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amina, and thank you, Bravo, again for your presentation. Um, a lot of things to debate, but now we'll have a quite from maybe provocative talk by Professor Cesar Tuiri. His talk uh, is establishing interregional and global partnerships, an ethical perspective on the good, the bad, and the ugly. But first, before you start, I will introduce yourself. So Cesar Tuiri is a philosopher and health ethicist from Ghana, who is currently 
actually the ethics lead for the University of Oxford in international health and tropical medicine. He is also an associate professor of applied philosophy and global health at the University of Ghana and an affiliate instructor at the University of Washington's Department of Bioethics and Humanities. Cesar is a member of WHO's COVID-19 Ethics and Governance Working Group, a member of the steering committee of the Global Forum for Bioethics in Research, a board member of the International Association of Bioethics, and a member of our COVID-19 Research Coalition's Ethics Working Group. So Cesar, the good, I hope there's not too much ugly. Let's go for it. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, as you can see, uh, only one slide. Um, in philosophy, we don't draw we don't draw diagrams. <laughs> we, we try to think things through. And I'm really excited, grateful, and happy to be here today um, to talk about our experience with the COVID-19 coalition um, research coalition ethics working group, and also some of the other working groups that have been part of during the COVID-19 pandemic. And what I'm going to share with you today are more high-level conceptual reflections about where ethics ought to be going if we are going to meet the challenges that we are currently facing and the ones that are coming towards us. There will not be enough time to then take these concepts that I'm going to um, identify and speak about and bring them down into real tools and even some of the tools are yet to be elaborated. So given this premise, the three questions that I have here, um, why do we need global partnerships? I'm going to try to offer three answers. We now live in an era where we talk about a lot of interdependence. And it's true, I mean, if you just look at each one of us here, we just only have to look at ourselves and what we are wearing and what we are eating and where we are sitting, and we'll realize that we are immersed in interdependence. Things that we use every day come from various parts of the world. We can't live without depending on other people who are far away from us. Interestingly, interdependence is a descriptive concept. That means that it just describes the way things are. It tells us the way things are. However, interdependence is not a normative concept. That means it is not a concept that gives itself rules. And the more we are interdependent, the more we need rules to govern how to be interdependent. Otherwise, interdependence simply becomes new channels, new pathways to perpetuate existing inequalities. An example. The North Atlantic slave trade would never have taken place as we know it to have taken place if Europe had not visited America. So the more we become closer to each other, the more we open up lines. But if we do not work on the ethics of those lines, then those lines can actually become channels of inequity. So we need to be, we are already independent, that's a given fact. How do we regulate this interdependence? Now, when we come to health, what we're talking about now are actually syndemics no longer epidemics and pandemics. Because the syndemics are a confluence of various factors that come in when we're beginning to talk about a disease. We're not talking about only, I mean, viruses. We're talking about culture. We're talking about social dimensions and social determinants of health. And we're also talking about international, re international relations. And we're talking about intra-country intra relations. So this brings together a set of factors that are much more difficult than simply talking about a health or a microbial or zoonotic issue. This is more complex. 
and syndemics generate what we now call, what we call wicked problems. And wicked problems do not have simple solutions. Wicked problems by nature are usually a manifestation of other underlying problems. So this is what we have to deal with. We need international collaborations because we can no longer live in islands. Two, the diseases that affect us are all diseases that are a confluence of so many different factors that it is better to think of them as syndemics. And three, these syndemics gen are generated as symptoms of underlying problems that we are part of wicked problems do not, that do not have simple solutions. Question one. Question two. Why do we why are some collaborations bad and ugly? Some collaborations are bad and ugly. One and here four reasons. One is that whenever we establish a collaboration, we never establish a collaboration in a vacuum. Tabula Ratsa. Collaborations are established within existing environments. And if the existing environment is already polluted, then the collaboration will be established within a polluted environment and is likely to be affected. So we need to be cognizant of the factors that are already driving global health world in which we live. And it is in this world that we are establishing our collaborations. And we need to identify what these problems are. Secondly, um, in our research work, there is something that we need to take account of. There is an issue of value ambivalence or precisely value ambiguity. So when we're starting a health research project, and we've just heard that, at the beginning of health research, we're always using a set of values. And those, that set of values are based on concepts like being in it together, sharing data, sharing information, collaborating. So that is the game. That's, those are the rules with which we start the game. But luckily, if this game is successful and it starts maturing into health interventions, we change the set of values. So we start with a set of values A, and towards the end, other values begin to play in like private property, intellectual property rights, and whatnot. Who changed the values, and when did they change, we don't know. It's like you, I mean, I, to teach my students, I often say, you set up, this is World Cup time, you put on your jersey, your football, and I mean, your boots and everything, and you start playing football. And those are the rules of the game, and we all, we all know the rules. And as you're going along, the referee is allowing some people to start playing handball as well. Before you realize, there are some people playing with their legs and their hands, and you are like a fool running around playing around only with your legs, you will lose because the game has been changed. But that's what happens to our research chain. So we need to clarify the values right from the start and be coherent with those values to the end. So if you ask me to share everything at the beginning, I want to share everything at the end. Um, now, coloniality is an important point here. And I don't talk about colonialism, because in theory, the colonials have gone. But the system stays on. And coloniality means that when we establish collaborations, we always have a center and a periphery. That's what coloniality does. And what coloniality does is that the periphery has an agency which has been subtracted and substituted, so that the agency is always working towards the interests of the center. And now, that center and periphery, yes, today it can be Africa, LMIC versus a high-income country, but let's not forget also within our countries, it is between the capital city and the village. And we need to address the challenges of coloniality. Finally, in the, the, good, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, we have issues of epistemicide. There are certain centers that actually are awarded gratuit gratuitously the title of being centers of knowledge. And other centers do not have knowledge. And therefore, when we talk about capacity building, we are actually trying to go around and impose models that will ensure that other people continue to serve the center. So we come back to what Franz Fanon, used, Franz Fanon says, is that you have given me my freedom so that I may build a world of you. So finally, how many more minutes do I have? Five.
five. Good. Seven. So I'm not doing too badly. I'm rushing my mind. So I'm not doing badly. So let's just get to the, the, good, the final part and let's talk about what would be the ingredients of a good collaboration. And I like the idea of the bad and the ugly because the solution to the bad and the ugly would be to have the good and the beautiful, which is the Greek ideal of um, ethics, the kalos kaigaton in Greek, right? And it's also the same in many African languages whereby when you're talking about ethics, in many African languages you find a conflation of the term beautiful and good together because there is an aesthetic dimension to the good as well. But in any case, good partnerships require that we try to rethink what ethics means. That's one of the lessons that I've taken home from the ethics working group of the coalition and other working groups, we need to rethink ethics. I mean, a lot of bioethics was born in the 1970s when we were trying to fight against paternalism, abuse of people in research, of participants and all that. That was very important because it was necessary at the time. But if you think about it, look at our COVID-19 vaccines. We managed to have these vaccines produced with ethical approval. But we were not able to distribute them ethically. So it means that there is something wrong with our ethical frameworks. We need to broaden them. Otherwise, they will just be addressing only certain issues and some of the wicked problems stay with us. So why do we need to revisit our ethical frameworks? We need to start rethinking, and rethinking sometimes requires two things. One is relearning, and the other one is abolitionism. Abolitionism means let's stop doing things the way we've always done them. So um, we always, you know, we create yeah, coalitions, we create uh, partnerships, and of course we just have one party leading, the other is collaborating, and this is the way we've always done things. So the next pandemic comes and we're going to go and do the same thing again. Can we think differently? It might be interesting to think of as using a solidaristic model. Solidarity Unlike charity, and um, Amina mentioned the Act Accelerator, private um, and public partnerships with a kind of charity model at the core. You see, solidarity is an enacted um, assistance of others with whom one recognizes similarities that are significant. Whereas charity means that charity can actually sometimes rely on differences. So I'm helping you because you are not like me. You're so unfortunate. And so I need to come to your aid. But solidarity relies on our shared similarity. And that shared similarity means that you and I are all in the same boat and we are fighting against our shared, I mean, our vulnerabilities, our common vulnerability to disease and to death. And it is standing together and standing for each other and standing with each other, which are the solidaristic terms, that we can win this game. And once again, if I may draw back again, since we're in World Cup season, my football image, and uh, sorry if it is a bit of a chauvinistic image, but female football is also very good. So anyway, I can talk about that. Um, is this. You know, you can have a good player who scores all the goals, but if the team loses, you're going home. And that's why we need solidaristic models to know that we're all playing in the same team. And therefore, when we start having nationalisms, it's like having star players who score a lot of goals, but yet their team is going back home because we're going to lose the battle. And that is why we need to think solidaristically, especially when creating partnerships. We are doing this as a team to win. And then, while we're creating the solidaristic, two, two minutes, good. Solid, solidarity goes together in this case with subsidiarity. Means that 
Let's not always try to resolve the problems at the higher instance. There are people who are closer to the problem. And those who are closer to the problem are the ones we should be listening to. And therefore, larger entities should not substitute the activities of smaller entities. And it is the duty, the subsidium of the bigger or stronger bodies is to support the smaller bodies to be able to do what they are supposed to do. And subsidiarity is not a principle of efficiency. It is a principle of justice. So the solution to a disease that is occurring in Kigali is not to be found in Geneva. It is the people of Kigali who need to be enabled to solve this problem. That is subsidiarity. And subsidiarity is not localism, because localism can sometimes mean, okay, just leave me alone and I'll do what I want. And we've seen how dictators have used that during the pandemic to be able to sort of like, I mean, basically enhance their totalitarian regimes. No, subsidiarity is linked to justice and fairness. So anyway, just to sum up, the three principles we need to bring in actively and we have to design tools to bring in so that it's like a test check on any international or in, I mean, large collaborations is that we need to put them under the, labor, the, the, the microscope to test them to see how solidaristic they are, how they practice subsidiarity and how they practice justice understood as equal moral concern for all the parents all the parties involved. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caesar. We've learned a lot with your 15 minutes. I think I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions at the end. I've learned, uh, I've learned a few words like coloniality, um, solidaristic model, and I'll try to you know, implement some of those um, principles. We will move to our next speaker, so uh, Dr. Wilbur Sabiti, who will be talking about uh, now we're going to dive a bit in the in another output of our, one of our working groups with uh, with Weber, who will speak about streamlining disease surveillance across Africa by building biobanking and sequencing capacity and insisting on the role of partnerships. So Dr. Uh, Wilbur Sabiti is a senior research scientist at the University of St. Andrews, specializing in translational diagnostics and antimicrobial resistance. His research group <clears throat> uses interdisciplinary approaches to maximize uptake of diagnostic and treatment tools into policy and practice with a special focus on low and middle income countries. He graduated uh, with a Bachelor in Science in Biochemistry from Makerere University in Uganda and then in Molecular Bio Biology from Vrije University in Brussels and a PhD from the University of Birmingham in the UK. Floor is yours. Thank you, Wilbur. Thank you, Natalie. I'm so glad and very privileged to follow the philosopher. And I indeed have learned uh, very important uh, concepts, uh, solidarity and subsidiarity. Uh, I think I would like to start by saying that we need uh, solidarity uh, in terms of uh, democratizing research and development so that uh, Africa is self-reliant in uh, innovations, solutions that they need to solve their challenges. So, can I have So I'm going to base my presentation on uh, the premise of what happened in COVID-19. And my working group, the virology, immunology, and the diagnostics group, our focus early uh, 
in the start of the COVID pandemic was to try and help uh, researchers, practitioners in low and middle income countries uh, address issues of uh, what is the infectious viral load, um, what, uh, how do you test, what are the standards, because as you remember when the pandemic came, everyone was running around trying to find a solution, uh, testing in whatever way they could. So we wanted to see how we can standardize the testing processes. And also uh, to understand the immunology of the virus, and especially when the vaccines came in, uh, what kind of immunity uh, the vaccines were inducing and what immunity uh, came from natural infection. So we thought that it's very important that there is uh, preservation of materials uh, that are, are being collected during the pandemic because at the time of the pandemic everyone was trying to respond, save lives, so there was no time for research. So biobanking uh, is that systematic preservation of uh, biological materials for future use in research and finding new solutions. So it's very critical in uh, uh, answering questions, research questions that cannot be answered at the point of diagnosis. And in the future, people can develop diagnostics, therapeutics or vaccines based on the materials that have been preserved. And then whole genome sequencing is the uh, systematic mapping of an organism's genetic material. So whole genome sequencing is uh, a relatively new uh, tool that uh, is now helping us understand uh, how organisms, for example, uh, resist uh, antibiotics or any other medicines, uh, or uh, how, how they transmit from one uh, organism to another. And it was very important that the early publication of the uh, genome uh, from uh, uh, China helped a quick response in terms of developing the new diagnostics and also people started designing epitopes for the vaccines. So it's very important and it gives more information than just a small uh, set of uh, diagnosis. So the area that we uh, understand the genetic information of the pathogen, the better in terms of designing tools to uh, diagnose or even uh, treat that pathogen. So what kind of capacity do we have uh, in Africa now? Um, so first, there is some level of biobanking that is happening in different parts of Africa. Either uh, uh, someone has one freezer, another one has two freezers, or some have big biorepositories that are already established. So there is a consortium that was established some time back, it's called H3 Consortium, and it involves around 30 African countries. And one of their remits is to uh, by bank some of the materials that they collect. So but it's not clear uh, what kind of, whether all the charter countries have biobanks or whether it's only a few that have biobanks. Then at the beginning of the pandemic, the school of, uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine uh, sat with Africa CDC to learn from the uh, experience of building the Zika uh, biobank network. And the result of that meeting was to use that plan to develop biobanks for COVID-19. However, it's not clear which biobanks were built after that meeting because I couldn't find them uh, uh, in the, the sources that I tried to visit. But if those biobanks exist, then it would be better if uh, Africa CDC can uh, put them on the website so that people know where such resources are and if they need to do research, they can contact them. But the important uh, point on that slide was that uh, from the Zika plan, uh, framework was established and rules of the game were established on how uh, 
by banking could take place, which is a, a good resource because, as uh, my colleague Caesar said, it's important to understand the rules, uh, right, and agree the rules of the game right from the beginning. So, in terms of uh, whole genome sequencing, so based on the GSAID database, the GSAID database is uh, a public-owned uh, uh, database uh, uh, under the Federal Republic uh, of Germany, and uh, uh, during COVID, all countries sequenced and submitted their sequences towards uh, to this data bank. So to assess how uh, African countries performed, uh, I looked at how many uh, genomes were submitted to this database. So uh, based on that graph, South Africa did submit over 40,000 uh, uh, genomes. And uh, only other three countries, uh, Kenya, Nigeria, and uh, the third one uh, submitted over 5,000 genomes to this database. So that indicates that there's some level of, uh, uh, of genome sequencing capacity uh, in over 90% African country. There was no genome submitted from uh, Eritrea. And, but it's not clear which sequencing platform the countries use, because there are two uh, main sequencing platforms. There's the Illumina sequence platform, which uses a big MySec machine. And then there's Oxford Nanopower sequencing platform that uh, kind of uses a chip uh, and uh, doesn't need a lot of uh, kind of maintenance. It's kind of quick and easy, and most uh, institutions can do that. So it's not clear what capacity in that uh, regard is available in these countries. So when you look at it in terms of proportion uh, to the cases of COVID-19 uh, tested in each country, so South Africa is no longer number one. It's actually somewhere in the middle on that red bar on the graph. It uh, only managed to sequence 1.2% of the COVID cases that were tested. So Gambia becomes the first having managed to sequence 11% uh, of its cases. However, the question is, could it be that uh, there was no testing in some of the countries, in which case the proportion is exaggerated because the testing wasn't uh, big enough? And the other, but the more fundamental question is, how many samples should be sequenced so that we can attain enough resolution uh, to detect uh, outbreaks of, of new variants that are emerging during the pandemic? So that's a question that needs to be answered by uh, science here in the room, Africa CDC, to come up with a convention of if you have an outbreak, how many uh, uh, samples should you sequence in order to attain enough resolution that will enable you to detect a new emerging uh, variants. Then, in terms of time to submission, so uh, around uh, five African countries took over 200 days to submit to this database. So it's only three African countries in the green uh, uh, bars uh, at the end that managed to submit the database uh, in less than 50 days from uh, the sequencing. So the question is, why did it take long to submit these sequences to the database? Because we know uh, from China, they published the, this first genome within 11 days. It's very critical for this information to be uh, published quite fast, because information is needed. All of you remember that uh, we were all hungry for new information, because uh, SARS-CoV-2 was fairly new uh, pathogen, and we needed as much information about it as we could. So publishing the genomes very fast is very critical in terms of designing tools to respond. But more fundamentally is, how long did it take for the sequence data to inform national COVID-19 responses? So did it inform uh, responses in, in the countries anyway? All the, the genomes were just sent and that was it. So because it's important that at the end of the day, this genomic data informs public health response in the country. So what are the opportunities and challenges in terms of by banking? So in most African countries, we can see there is some level of by banking taking place. 
So most buybacks are owned by individuals, uh, individual principal investigators or institutions, and there's little coordination. So it's uh, the onus of the Africa CDC to ensure that there's uh, a level of coordination at national and uh, inter, uh, inter uh, continental level. And what we need to note is that we have to be uh, careful what we are preserving and how we are preserving it. Because, for example, if you take blood as an example, if your future uh, research question is about genomic uh, application, you need to preserve that blood in a certain way. And if your future application is uh, immunological assessment, like vaccine development, serology, and whatever, you need to preserve that blood in a different way. So if we just preserve uh, these samples without a question in mind what we want to do with the samples, they will soon become useless because we will find that what we want to ask, uh, these samples cannot answer that. So especially preserved without target application in mind may become useless uh, in the future. Buy banks are very in uh, energy intensive, so we need to think about how do we uh, uh, keep them running uh, over a long period, even when there's no pandemic. And that's why we need to think about, uh, do we need a biobank in every small institution, or we need one central biobank in a country in order to uh, serve uh, the, the resources that we have uh, for that. And what ethical and material transfer cover do we, do we ask for that? Because if uh, you want to use samples 10 years from now, what kind of ESCO coverage do you get from the, the donors of those samples? In most cases, it has been uh, specific questions. So what happens if you get a new question along the way? That means your samples will not help you because you are not covered for such samples. And in terms of uh, genomic uh, sequencing, I think very important uh, on uh, this slide is that we need to think about how many sequencing platform do we need in each country. Uh, as, uh, for example, the Illumina sequencing platform, and I understand there is a partnership between uh, Illumina and Africa CDC to supply these sequencing machines to institutions in Africa. But if there is no capacity of uh, the different samples, uh, like many samples to be sequenced, then maintaining such a machine is very difficult. I can tell you that uh, at the University of St. Andrews where I work, we are fairly rich university, but we couldn't keep our sequencer because we can't afford the service contract. So we have decommissioned it because a sample at my institution will cost you uh, around 70 to 100 pounds. But if I send a sample to Birmingham where they are large and they have more sample, it will cost only four pounds to sequence that sample. So we need to think carefully uh, whether we, every institution needs a, a sequencer or whether we need one center where we can give it large uh, batch, uh, number of samples to, to, to deal with. And of course, the ethical framework very important in material transfer. And also, how do we deal with information from genome sequencing? Do we punish those who have published the data of what they have found, or do we praise them and say, okay, we learn from this and uh, respond properly to the outbreak? So in terms of working with uh, the, the coalition and uh, developing partnerships, uh, the coalition has members in all uh, parts of African countries, and this means that uh, we can partner with Africa CDC in answering some of uh, these uh, questions. Because, uh, and over half of our academic, of our members uh, have academic uh, affiliations, and we had a meeting with Africa CDC some time back, and they expressed their need of uh, increasing epidemiological and bioinformatics uh, skills. And I think, uh, as a coalition, that's an area we can uh, work with them to uh, improve, to build such uh, capacities. The, 
there is need also to understand what kind of capacity was built by AfroScreen. So AfroScreen was a project funded by the French government to the tune of 20 million euros for uh, 12 African countries to build capacity in terms of genomics and diagnostic for COVID. So what capacity was built and how can it uh, link into what Africa CDC passenger passenger initiative has been uh, building. We need to streamline uh, procurement, very important for effectiveness of these uh, platforms. Uh, I remember during the pandemic, the uh, the director of Africa CDC was lamenting about how Africa had been uh, kind of squeezed out of accessing these uh, reagents and consumers they needed to do the testing for COVID-19. So how do we do that? We now build our own capacity. Learning from what Caesar said, uh, we shouldn't build centers to make someone at the center happy. Maybe it's better to build self-reliance so that maybe Africa can produce these uh, reagents and uh, tools so to use without having to go uh, buying elsewhere well because it's difficult to procure those uh, uh, equipment. And how do we develop a model for maintaining background surveillance and uh, reactivating the, uh, when we have emergencies because when during the pandemic everyone can spend money but when there's no pandemic uh, priorities change but it's very important that we keep this back on surveillance and then we are able to activate uh, when there is an emergency and these pandemics are not stopping they are coming already we've had the market uh, pox we've already had of the ebola uh, uh, in uganda so they are coming they are ongoing so we need to make sure that our, the, what we have learned from covid the uh, platforms we built are maintained and they can be reactivated wherever there is uh, an emergency uh, like that thank you very much Thank you very much, Wilbur. Um, I hope next year you can come with different graphs. <laughs> That's my hope. Um, and we'll have questions, I'm sure, at the end. So now we're going to move to something absolutely different. Um, we're moving a little bit more <clears throat> towards social sciences, but from the maternal uh, health working group. Um, Lauren will speak to the importance of context-specific prevention and control strategies some research work that was done in an assessment of strategies like lockdown on communities and the evidence from a global systematic review on the impact of lockdown on uh, early pregnancy. So Dr. Lauren Hockham is an academic clinical fellow who splits her time between clinical work as an infectious disease specialist in the UK and uh, a researcher in Uganda. Her interests include infections in pregnant women, and children. She is the coordinator of our coalition's maternal, newborn, and child health working group. Over to you, Lori. Thank you. Can you hear me? Um, I would just also like to say Natalie was telling the truth when she said I had just arrived. I left my house <laughs> at Saturday lunchtime. Ooh. And I arrived uh, this morning about 90 minutes ago, so apologies for looking like I've just stepped up a plane. I have. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, I'm going to talk about uh, a project that the Maternal, Neonatal and Child Health Working Group uh, have been working on. Uh, so the MNCH Working Group, for short, uh, is chaired by uh, two women, so uh, Professor Ludware in Uganda and uh, Dr. Tanusha Ramdin in South Africa. On the right-hand side of the screen, you can see uh, one of our uh, publications, which we uh, made at the beginning of the pandemic, really trying to understand what the priorities for MNCH would be uh, as we, we learn to deal with COVID. Uh, after that was published and in discussion with our working group members, uh, we felt that in our local settings, uh, 
we were seeing an increase uh, in adolescent pregnancies. Uh, we have members across uh, Africa, Asia, Europe, and Central and South America. Um, we know that lockdown restrictions have caused disruption to education uh, and to sexual and reproductive health services across the globe. Uh, previous uh, evidence from Sierra Leone during the Ebola outbreak showed that in some communities uh, there was a rise in, in up to 66% in adolescent pregnancy. And there was a concern that this could be happening at a much larger scale um, across many more countries. Why is it important? So uh, early childbearing, pregnancy and delivery um, as an adolescent can derail a girl's healthy development into adulthood and have profound negative impacts uh, on their education, livelihoods and health. Uh, girls can be forced to drop out of school, and uh, clearly there are long-reaching implications if that happens on their educational and employment opportunities. There's also uh, social consequences. Um, there can be stigma, rejection, violence from family members, partners, peers, uh, and forced early marriage. It's also a, a health concern, so um, maternal conditions are amongst the top cause of uh, DALI, so disability-adjusted life years and death amongst girls aged 15 to 19, and the neonatal outcomes are also uh, worse uh, for their babies, so there's a higher rate of preterm birth, low birth weight, uh, and stillbirth. So what we saw coming out fairly early on in the pandemic in reports uh, and in newspaper articles was that there was a significant spike, um, particularly in, in, in our setting in Uganda, um, in Malawi, and in um, South Africa. So UNICEF uh, reported a 20% spike in East Uganda. Um, Malawi said 13,000 girls had gotten pregnant in the first stage of their lockdown. Uh, and a, a much larger international survey, the Rutgers survey, uh, showed that over 30% of women surveyed in Ghana, Kenya, Uganda, and Zimbabwe weren't able to access family planning services. Uh, and there was uh, an increase in transactional sex because of economic hardship due to lockdowns. But um, it was pretty clear that actually overall the picture regarding teenage pregnancies was not clear. The, those early reports uh, of significant spikes in pregnancies may not be reliable, and actually what is needed is good quality data from individual countries. So uh, what we have done uh, is undertaken um, a project to look at this in more detail. So the first component um, is a literature review looking at quantitative and qualitative data uh, around adolescent pregnancy, lockdown, and uh, adolescent girls' sexual reproductive health during lockdowns and COVID. Um, because we have such a large international team, we're able to search in English, French, and Spanish. Uh, and our full protocol is available via Prospero, so you can uh, link to it afterwards if you are interested in reading the whole thing. Um, so the literature review, we started in April. Um, so the first component was quantitative uh, data, so uh, papers which have shown, you know, in, in their reports, an increase or a decrease or no change at all in adolescent pregnancy. Um, we found 3,977 articles that needed screening. Uh, only six actually were relevant, um, so really a dearth of data. And for the qualitative review, um, we found more articles, so 5,369, which we have screened, 99 uh, will be included in the final review. Uh, the data extraction for that is ongoing. 
We were also interested in looking at country level data as it was available. Um, so we've looked uh, through World Bank, UNICEF, DHS, WHO data sets. Uh, we try to get data from countries themselves. Um, and we've done that by kind of splitting a much larger team into smaller groups focused on individual regions. That also commenced in April of 2022. Um, so I will present the results for the quantitative literature review because we finished uh, screening and extracting data from those papers. Uh, and they were actually both from Kenya. Uh, and both showed a steady rise in the number of pregnancies uh, in girls. So the first, uh, by Zulekea et al., uh, showed that girls who'd remained out of secondary school for six months due to lockdown had twice the risk of pregnancy and three times the risk of dropping out of school when compared to girls uh, before the outbreak. Uh, and Shikuku et al. Uh, looked at national DHS data and again saw a steady rise in the number of pregnancies uh, in 15 to 19 year old girls during the, the COVID-19 period. Uh, and country level data, so again our focus on um, Africa region. Um, we know generally over time trends are pointing downward, so I know the slide is difficult to read, but you should be able to appreciate that all the lines are going down, which is good. Um, but we're missing data from 2021 still. Uh, and for obvious reasons, data from 2020 won't be inclusive of all girls who got pregnant during lockdowns because it takes nine months to, to see the outcome of that. Um, the DHS data, um, so there are some surveys which have data from 2021, um, which we will look in into more detail. Um, you can see that in, in uh, two countries there's been a slight trend upwards, but it's too early to really understand what's happened there. Um, we were, we're still kind of looking in further detail. Um, we have also tried to get data directly from um, ministries, but have so far been unsuccessful. And I think this echoes other points from previous speakers about needing open and accessible data uh, in Uganda. In particular, we have DHS2 data, um, which has this information. We just uh, don't have access to it at the minute. And there will be equivalent systems in other countries. Um, the next thing that we are doing that we would love um, to have your involvement with um, is a survey. So it's clear that country level data is lagging behind, um, but we, we still do want to understand what is happening um, at a national level, but also in smaller regional and district levels. Um, so we've developed a new survey, which is an update to our previous one, which was the paper that was at the start of the presentation. Um, that survey is open, so if you're in the room and you work in MNCH uh, or have colleagues who do who you think would be interested in participating, um, you can scan the QR code or you can find me afterwards and I will send you the link. Um, the survey uh, currently, the last time I checked, had about 40 responses, uh, the majority from Africa, um, and uh, the respondents from each of those countries did say in their own regions they had seen an increase in adolescent pregnancy. Uh, it takes just five to ten minutes to complete, it's very quick. Um, and my email address is there as well if you'd like further information after the presentation. Uh, so in summary, so there's a lot of literature and reports saying what the impact of the pandemic might have been, but actually there's very little data at present to state what has actually happened or little data available to us. Um, we are eagerly awaiting the 2021 data and we'll analyze it as we get it. 
um, a personal plea if you have any access to data that you would like to share or you would like to be involved in the project again please contact me we're uh, very happy to have new members and contributors and that's a thanks to our MNCH working group members without whom we would not be able to run the project and that's it Thank you very much, Lauren. Your plane was late, but you are sharp on time. Excellent. So I, I just ask a clarification question. The qualitative survey, is it also ask, so it's asking questions to the young girls? OK. Thanks. I think we should uh, maybe move to the next presentation. Thank you again so much. Uh, we will continue with uh, more, um, more in, the, in the social science field um, with, uh, <coughs> with Luisa's presentation on interdisciplinary methods, bringing together epidemiology and social science approaches, so going to the communities, I think. Um, so Luisa um, is, uh, Dr. Luisa is an assistant professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Her research focuses on ethnographic approaches to conflict, humanitarian interventions, and global health, particularly in West Africa. In 2015, she was deployed as an anthropologist to support the response to the West African Ebola outbreak. Since then, her work has focused on outbreak preparedness and response, community engagement with clinical research and the politics of emergency and crisis management. She has developed applied social science training for a range of audiences, including community health workers conducting research on vaccine hesitancy, and more recently, local experiences in COVID-19. Thank you, Florence, over yours. You hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks so much to all the speakers. It's really uh, wonderful to hear everyone's views and to have all of you here. Um, so I'm going to continue kind of thinking about this idea of interdisciplinarity and so think about how we apply it in practice. Uh, and I'll be reflecting on some of the work and the experiences of our of the Coalition Social Science Working Group. Um, Okay, uh, so I'm going to be thinking about interdisciplinarity in particular on the relationship and the potential relationship and opportunities of bringing together social science and epidemiology, but I think some of these lessons hopefully apply more broadly and beyond epidemiology as well. Um, and I'll be talking about areas of current work where this is happening already and as well as kind of potential for future collaboration, but I want to spend a bit of time also th talking honestly and frankly about some of the challenges as well and some of the, um, the difficulties at times of doing kind of meaningfully uh, integrated interdisciplinary work so that we can actually think about what, um, what that can look like in practice in the future. Um, so historically, I think this isn't new, that social science, and I'll, I'll be talking about it from an anthropological perspective, but um, other social sciences as well, uh, that there is a, a long history of collaboration and potential between social science and epidemiology. Um, I mean, the growth of social epidemiology, for example, that's been taking into account sort of political economies and political ecologies of, of disease, that's been sort of expanding and reshaping the way in which we think about risk and how we think about uh, public health measures. Measures. I think um, HIV was probably the most obvious um, point, turning point, into thinking about how epidemics are social and political problems. Uh, but in our experience as a working group, and um, all of us have worked in one way or the other across epidemics, Ebola in West Africa was really a turning point uh, in terms of the, the recognition and integration of anthropology in, uh, in epidemic response. Um, this, you know, many of us were involved in high highlighting the importance of context, understanding social, political dynamics, historical dynamics that I think Caesar has already pointed to as well, to some extent, and kind of rethinking about protocols like for safe burials, for example, how these could integrate uh, the very real sort of local uh, challenges and concerns and anxieties around some public health measures that, um, uh, that are implemented during outbreaks. Um, and this has led over the years so since the end of the West African Ebola outbreak to some level 
level of institutionalization of social science. So we've had um, the, the Social Science for Humanitarian Action platform, for example. There's been a development of the Integrated Outbreak Analytics Working Group, uh, and our own social science working group within the coalition really is focused on thinking about how we can uh, develop sort of operational but also academically rigorous social science during epidemics uh, to contribute to broader discussions about epidemic control and, and different kinds of public health measures. And I think this has continued during COVID-19, although I think that, and we can maybe discuss this more in the discussion, I think there have been some cha challenges and some limitations in actually taking some of this lesson forward uh, during COVID, I think primarily sort of because COVID was a, a politically very different uh, kind of context and different kind of crisis across the world. Yeah. Um, so I won't go through all of these, but these are some examples of the kind uh, of work that uh, the social scientists have been doing in our working group and beyond, uh, and kind of the opportunities that we see or things that are already being implemented in terms of the sort of work that social scientists can do in collaboration to support um, epidemiologists and clinicians uh, in, in public health generally and in epidemics in particular. Uh, I've already mentioned, for example, the, uh, the significance of uh, of anthropological approaches in redesigning protocols for safe burials, for example, during Ebola, across different Ebola outbreaks and COVID as well. Uh, I think also seems like a small contribution, but I think quite an important one uh, of kind of understanding that if you're going to be quarantining people, you need to think about their livelihoods, for example. So there were West African anthropologists who were very involved in sort of thinking about how to uh, develop, for example, farming groups that could farm for people in quarantine so that you could, uh, they were in incentivized to stay, stay in quarantine. Um, we've also been involved, I've been working in the Ebola um, vaccine trials for the last seven years, and so there our role really is to sort of think about uh, participant perspectives and experiences and making sure that their voices are included in how we think about ethical uh, protocols and, and also in the, the protocols of how the trial is implemented. And, and as, a, um, as an outcome of, uh, of that experience during Ebola, we've also been working really closely with, with modelers to sort of think about how we can make sure that epidemiological models actually take context into account. That we think, for example, that the, the, the household as a unit means very different things in different contexts. That people's social um, contact patterns are very different in different countries. They're very different from uh, the city to the village, as Caesar was saying. They're very different across different countries, so we can't be using the same uh, sort of models everywhere. Um, and, and similarly, we've been thinking about how we can uh, think about community-based surveillance in a way that integrates uh, so indigenous concepts of disease and that thinks about uh, these questions about, um, uh, about social contact patterns in a contextual way and in a way that is uh, locally appropriate and, and embedded. And I think one thing I wanted to mention too is that we study the community and I think we, as, as social scientists, are, we are, our goal, our interest is in giving voice to, to people who are affected and kind of creating spaces for that. But we do also study up, so we also think about global health. Uh, we think about epidemiologists as having culture that needs to be studied, and to think about how cultures within global health response, for example, also influences the ways in which we are able to respond um, to epidemics, and so bringing those things together. Uh, so these are the sort of things that we've been doing and that social scientists have been contributing. And I think there is a lot of potential for really exciting and kind of innovative integration and collaboration. But as I was saying earlier, I think that in order to do that, we have to also be clear about what some of the challenges are. And I think sometimes we sort of tend to, to focus on the excitement of collaboration without thinking about how do we actually do this. Uh, I think so, a lot of our colleagues in the uh, social science working group feel that although there are still some challenges and so sort of recognizing the significance of social science uh, for pandemic research, we, I think we've moved beyond having to sort of justify the importance of social science, but it's a question of how do we actually do this in practice? How do we uh, work together and what does that actually mean? And I think there are a few sort of practical things and a few more sort of conceptual epistemological challenges. Um, so practically, we, we need to be thinking about how do we move out of silos? A lot of the time, we, we all are in the same research space, but very much working within, for example, I think the coalition has been thinking a lot about how do we move beyond the working group model where we actually do interdisciplinary and interworking group uh, collaboration. Um, 
I think in particular for social science, I think it's also about reframing what our position is in that. So not just about sort of building acceptability for interventions or for clinical trials, for example, or for any kind of public health measure, but really thinking about how do we co-produce and kind of develop protocols together with communities uh, and think about even what kind of scientific questions we should be asking uh, together with, um, with, with, with people who will be affected by them and who will be participating uh, in them. Uh, and in order to do this, I think we also have to sort of confront some of the more, as I was saying, kind of epistemological challenges. So there are still some hierarchies uh, of evidence in terms of what counts as good evidence and what doesn't. And I think Caesar's point about epistemicide is also quite important in terms of thinking about uh, whether community knowledge and knowledge that already exists uh, in a lot of the communities in which we work could be leveraged or, or could be seen as valid uh, knowledge that can be integrated, it can be used uh, to co-develop uh, research protocols and, and clinical trials and, 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 and everything else. Uh, and so I think it's about really kind of questioning what kind of cultures of evidence uh, we have in, the, in our spaces, in our collaborative spaces, and thinking about how we can uh, challenge those and re rethink what that means uh, in practice. Uh, and I think the final sort of uh, structural challenge that I want to mention here in the challenges is about funding, because it always is, right? Uh, uh, and I think that um, for as much as we've been sort of talking in, uh, about interdisciplinarity across different international spaces and in global health, I think there are still some significant challenges to get funding and to ensure that funding structures actually enable and encourage meaningful in, uh, interdisciplinary collaboration. So for example, for clinical trials, a lot of the time funders don't envision a social science or a community engagement component. And so this, uh, this kind of funding has to be sourced separately, which means that it makes it harder to actually integrate um, this work and sort of start the, the work together from the beginning when you're designing a protocol, for example. Um, so I think these are some of the challenges, but I think that we can uh, certainly over, overcome them. But I think, as I was saying, I think if we don't sort of think about what meaningful collaboration means and what it looks like in practice, uh, it, becomes, it becomes harder to do. Uh, so what, uh, these are some of the opportunities I think that we can, uh, we can achieve and we can aim towards if we, if we do take this question of collaboration seriously and we sort of think about what it means to talk to each other across, uh, across disciplinary boundaries, to uh, talk to each other across kind of cultural boundaries um, as well. So part of it is maybe to rethink, rather than thinking about interdisciplinarity, to think about transdisciplinarity so that actually we are developing, uh, as I was saying, that we are developing the way in which we think about um, epidemic response and pandemic research together, uh, so that we're setting the priorities together across disciplines with affected communities, with patients from the start, uh, so that co-production is, is meaningful in that way, rather than so, for example, in the context of clinical trials, often what happens is that we arrive with ready-made protocols that then we need to sort of work with communities to engage them around them. But I think there is potential and there are lots of discussions for how we could do more deliberative engagement around uh, clinical trial protocol from the start. Um, and, and, and similarly, so I think this has to go along with sort of, you know, it starts uh, right from the beginning, so we don't, we can't do this from scratch. It's also about rethinking about uh, public health curriculums and thinking about how we can sort of institutionalize and really root these kind of transdisciplinary approaches uh, in, in how we train public health practitioners, uh, also in how we train anthropologists and medical anthropologists, right, to be able to communicate <laughs> with epidemiologists or be able to understand uh, other disciplines as well. Uh, and I think this is really in line with sort of the Africa CDC's interest in the new public health order and thinking about, uh, for me, in my perspective, localizing is not just about... <clears throat> you know, rethinking about re where resources come from, but also whose knowledge matters and whose voices are listened to uh, and whose science uh, is significant. Uh, and so locally led approaches is also about thinking about um, shifting power uh, at all levels in that sense. Um, and I don't, I don't know how much more time I have. Yeah? Okay, so then I'll just conclude with an exa a practical example of, uh, of how we're trying to do this to kind of take it back to, um, to epidemiology in particular 
particular. So with my colleague, uh, Dr. Alai Jin Jai, who's at the College of Medicine in Sierra Leone, where, where I work, uh, we've been thinking about uh, taking uh, community-based surveillance, which has been uh, a model that's been developed in Sierra Leone since the Ebola outbreak, and to some extent, uh, very successfully. Uh, but we've been sort of taking it as a case study, as an example of how we can really rethink um, how do we how do we actually integrate how do we make it really meaningfully community based, right? So in in our perspective, this isn't just about making sure that, for example, traditional healers or community members or community leaders uh, are trained in epidemiological uh, reporting, detection, reporting structures. It's actually about thinking about how do the knowledge of traditional healers, for example, of, of community leaders of women. Uh, women groups, for example, are actually integrated in how we even think about those, um, those uh, reporting structures, those uh, case definitions, for example, or how we develop protocols for community-based quarantine and so on. So it's about uh, you know, thinking about the community-based approach being two ways. Um, so, yeah, I look forward to some discussions. Uh, I really want to thank the, the, the coalition for, for having us and hosting this event and the social science working group for uh, for all the work that we've been doing together. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, it was also nice to see that you're, you know, cross-talking to Cesar's uh, point. So it, this is the start of the trans, uh, well, let, let's see how we, we continue the dialogue on this, but thank you so much. We'll move to our last presentation, which will look at the future now. With Brenda, we're going to look at priorities for Africa, focus areas as we pivot to pandemic preparedness. So Dr. Brenda Okwari is a physician, infectious disease, clinical researcher, and public health specialist from Uganda. She has over a decade's experience in the execution of quality research in sub-Saharan Africa, working in her different capacities as clinical trial coordinator and investigator. Her research work has included understanding the transmission dynamics of tuberculosis, the impact of HIV, co-infection on host immunity against TB and investigating efficacy of new TB drugs and TB regimens. Dr. Hukwari now uh, lends her expertise to our coalition as a scientific coordinator, providing scientific support to various expert working groups. The floor is yours, Brenda. Let's look at the future. Thank you so much for that gracious introduction. It's always strange hearing about yourself, but um, thank you once again. Um, I'm privileged to stand here today. To a great extent, it almost feels like I'm preaching to the choir. So in case we break out in song at the end, hypothetical or literally, uh, it's acceptable. <laughs> so my role today is to kind of sum up what has been said before, but also help us look to the future, right, and see what more we can do as we think about pandemic preparedness. I'll start from the history of outbreaks in Africa. Africa is not new to outbreaks, nor are outbreaks new to Africa. From as far back as we can think, or it has been recorded, there's always a story of some sort of outbreak. Um, I remember in school stories of how kingdoms were rising and falling because of outbreaks, and one which stands out uh, in my memory is jiggers. So outbreaks are big and they can change an entire community. But even in recent days, we're still talking about outbreaks. Some of the data for the past year on uh, reportable health emergencies and public health threats coming out of the WHO showed more than 700 events. That to me sounds like a lot, right? And even then, the majority are still from the African region. That's 67%. So it almost behooves us to kind of be experts in this area, or at least add our voices in general to pandemic preparedness. Let's look closer at Africa. So 130 new public health threats or emergencies for the period June 2021 to June 2022, 80% of them being infectious diseases, the leading one being cholera. Cholera is as old as old can be, yet we are still dealing with it today. 
Uh, if we take a look at some of the more recent data, like the weekly bulletins that come out of WHO, we see new outbreaks, two new events from the East African region. Ebola, which has been referenced by some of the speakers on the stage, as well as cholera again. So we still have a lot going on in the region. And in addition to that, we have various humanitarian crises. So our situation is a lot unique. And who best to tell the story or the solutions to these problems than us? So I picked the example of the Ebola virus. It's over 40 years old. Since its first diagnosis in the mid-70s in DRC, uh, we've had 38 outbreaks in 11 countries. This is a breakdown across the different decades. The 80s were a good time. There was good music, but it seems there was also no Ebola outbreaks in the 80s. But if you look at 2020, it looks like we're still in it, and it's just a matter of time before we see another outbreak. For the 2020s, so far we have three countries. Uh, including Uganda, DRC, and Guinea, and we are seeing more outbreaks bound to happen. So what have we learned from Ebola? Some of the lessons have been shared by Louisa, but what are some of the broad concepts? First of all, in engagement with the local leadership is key. You cannot come up with any strategy in the absence of the local leadership. Secondly, we must understand the community context as well as their coexisting priorities. And the coexisting priorities are not only health related. We need to think broader, we need to think beyond health. Think of climate related events, things such as drought or food insecurity or natural disasters and how these will affect our strategy or our approach as we go into different communities. <coughs> We mustn't forget also the cross-disciplinary approach. It has been highlighted by my colleagues today on the stage, and I cannot emphasize it enough. The beauty that comes from diversity in expertise as well as in experience. We must as well manage the message. Never underestimate the power that a wrong rumor can have on a community. We've seen the amount of information, misinformation, Information and everything else in between that happened during the COVID pandemic. So as what I would call the leaders or the people in the know, we must be able to actively take steps to manage the message that is being shared, speak the facts, keep the community, keep the community aware of what is happening, keep them engaged so that we can build that community trust. And lastly, what we've seen, especially with the example of Ebola, is that outbreaks are here to stay. Looking back at the 10 years, we have seen a 63% increase in zoonotic infections. So we're not about to get rid of our animals. So what we need to do is learn how to manage what might come up as a result of that. We're still going to go mining in the caves. And yeah, we have to be prepared for the consequence of that. Next, I'd like to look at the COVID experience in Africa and try and see if there are additional lessons that we can pick from there to inform how we look at pandemics in the future. At the start of the pandemic, there was a lot of doom and gloom that was predicted for Africa. In many cases, they said the bodies would be lined with streets. And who was giving the story? Most probably not us, right? So as the pandemic progressed, we saw a different reality. The number of cases looked lower than what was being seen globally, as well as the mortality, as evidenced by those two uh, maps at the top of the slide. But also what we saw was the narrative was now changing into trying to understand why Africa had defied its predictions on COVID. So that makes one think that, of course, the COVID experience in Africa is different. What made it unique? And these are just some of um, the key points or thoughts as to what might have contributed to the unique experience in Africa. First of all, the demographic. 
we are, the continent is a young, a young population. So maybe that played a role in how the disease was, um, was shown or the, the disease process played out. We also cannot forget our capacity. Capacity in case identification as well as mortality monitoring and capturing of that data. How about the role of natural immunity? How about the role of pre-existing conditions or different strains of coronavirus and their impact on our immunity? How about the past experience and what it has taught us and how it made us better prepared to handle the epidemic? We mustn't forget that we're working in resources which are often meager. So in the end, what we saw for Africa was 2.2% of the global cases and 4% of the global deaths. So numbers not as bad as previously predicted, but still significant. And also justifying that each different region or dif each different community needs a sort of um, community-tailored approach that is suitable to their own experience. Furthermore, across the continent, like seen in many parts of the world, we saw that leadership was key. Depending on the direction that the leadership went, it would determine how that community or how that country responded. Something else that we saw from the pandemic, which we are still seeing, is the gross inequities. Inequities in innovations, things such as diagnostics. Maybe that's why our numbers are so low. Things like vaccines. We've only received 5% of the global vaccine stash. Things like therapeutics. Some of us have still not seen any monoclonal antibody on the continent. Maybe we won't. Are they even still relevant? And these are still some of the questions that we need to keep asking and some of the reasons why we should better understand our own context and community. So, there was also good that came out of the pandemic in the past few years, and some of these are things which we should continue to leverage and continue to build capacity in. We need strong leadership, not just at the political level, but also at the institutional level, in the space of health. We need to continue exercising or advocating for good, strong leadership. We saw a rapid repurposing of some of the previous out mechanisms, which is a big plus. But did that repurposing make us any faster in our approach towards the pandemic? There was an improvement in surveillance and data collection frameworks, which is good, but we can continue to do better. We saw partners, partnerships strengthened. We have a good example of the Africa CDC and what it has been able to do across the region, but more can be done. There was improvement in capacity of the individuals, the health workers, as well as infrastructural capacity. Uh, Dr. Wilb already spoke about lab capacity, but it's a good example because at the start of the pandemic, only two countries were able to sequence viral genomes. But now, 2022, 37. That's a good, you know, upward graph in any, <laughs> in any situation. And that's the momentum that we need to keep. We look at labs which were able to diagnose COVID. At the start, only two. But now, two years later, a thousand. Imagine if we applied that momentum to every single area of capacity that is needed to address a pandemic. We would go far and fast. We also saw the importance of civil society organization engagement. Another area which we saw a slight boost in, unfortunately triggered in some cases by restrictions on movement or shipment across borders that came during the pandemic. And this is in supply chain mechanisms. And how some countries pivoted was to build their local supply. For example, in things like PPE, masks, gloves, and that sort of basic medical equipment, which previously might have had to be important. We saw also differences in diagnostics. It might have come a little bit later, but it made a difference. And here I'm referring specifically to the rapid, the rapid 
uh, the rapid testing, which were more cost efficient, you get a quick result, and made diagnostics scalable for different communities. So there is definitely a lot that we can build on and how the capacity can be leveraged to address other pandemics. Okay, we'll give it a moment to change. All right, so let's go back to the intention of this talk, talking about what is needed for preparedness, but slightly different. We'll look at it from the angle of, of perspectives. There's a lot of literature already out there on what the pillars are for pandemic preparedness, but let's look at this as some of the enabling and enabling factors. Primarily, you need an environment that will support pandemic preparedness. And what this starts with is good political will. But good political will is good. It's intention. But you need something to back that intention. And that comes with financing. Before that, it's just good intention. And the road to hell is paved with good intention. <laughs> So when you look at other building blocks that are needed for pandemic preparedness, some have already been mentioned, many are not new. Things like building strong and resilient health systems, we still have a lot to do in that area. We talk about surveillance systems, our diagnostic and uh, biobanking and sequencing capacity and ability to detect can always be improved. We think of having coordination. coordination is is key, otherwise we have uh, what Luisa spoke of, of having us working in silos. And lastly, we must look at supply chain infrastructure. And all of these have to be relevant to the local context. And in order to do that, we must have quality data generation from the different contexts. So some key considerations, again, the local context, take into account social political aspects as well as cultural and religious and other ongoing health priorities, strive to ensure continuity of care. We've seen declines as um, as Lauren mentioned, in sexual and reproductive health services. Or think of other infectious diseases like TB. We need to involve all key, all key stakeholders right from the start. Remember to gather your data because that is what is going to be the evidence that shall inform future policy. And even in the national preparedness plans, we mustn't forget research as well as aspects that are geared towards having a steady, sustainable resource mobilization plan. So in conclusion, when we think of pandemic preparedness and the priorities, let us think broadly of how we can prevent, prepare, and detect the outbreaks. And this means that we should constantly be on high alert and maintain that high index of suspicion. Again, let us continue to advocate for our own policies to be informed by our own evidence that is generated. We have earned the right to sit at the table that makes the decisions about the strategies that are used in the continent. And lastly, a disease threat anywhere is a disease threat everywhere. And that only justifies the need for having mutually beneficial partnerships. So I'll stop there and let you break out in song. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brenda. That was an excellent summary. And I think we have little time, but I would like to open the floor for discussions or questions. Yes. If you don't mind introducing yourself for the recording, please. Okay. Thank you very much. It is nice sitting and listening to this. And thank you, Oscar, for addressing the guys in the biomedical space. Because I think some of the key things you are suffering from are that in the 20th century, the biomedical people had problems with infringements of people's rights. We went to philosophy and cherry picked ethics and left the other metaphysics, epistemology. Then we focused on the individual, and that's why the, the ethics issues are making us have problems because we cherry picked nicely. Then with that, then I can introduce myself. I'm Bernard Sogutu from Kenya. 
I work in the research space. And I think if we cherry picked and left that, and that's why we have problems with ethics, because even if you look at the, the, the philosophy that we look at, the philosophy of the human being is very rich. We water it down when you come with the philosophy of health. And we go to the philosophy of global health, it is totally warped. We have literally watered it down. And that's what brings us some of the things like we talk of solidarity, subsidiarity. It's totally left out. And I think these are some of the things that we need to start bringing the other things into play, really to make sure that we basically get there. The other major thing that we, those of us in the health space, we think the population needs health interventions. We have no marketing strategy of anything we build. When we come up with things, we release guidelines, instructions, without thinking, what is the population thinking? We need to have a marketing strategy. These things, they just don't need them. And that's what globally we have been doing year in, year out. And COVID showed us that you can say them, and the population can ignore them, and they will continue. You can bring your vaccines, we will not take them, and because we lacked a marketing strategy. We just thought they need them, and I think those are some of the things that we have learned, and we need really to look out how do we get away from that. In the same thing, those of us who are lucky who are discussing adaptive clinical trial in a new dispensation. And I think these are some of the things that we need to interrogate ourselves and see. Because some of the things that we really want to work on are the same things. We have an inherent problem as human beings, which is called dominance preservation. It is at all levels. Even from the UN, we have the permanent member states. We have the G7. It's purely preserving dominance, and that's something that we have to inherently work on, especially in the health space, and these are things that are with us. When we talk of decolonizing, I think the issue of the victim and the victor, all of us need decolonization, and I think these are some of the things that we need to look at. It's really want to work in this pandemic space, and I think the pandemics are good. They tell us the narcoleptic nature of us in the health profession that we have been sleeping on the job. The, because the, but the endemic diseases tell us of the apathetic way we look at things because they are with us always. And I think these are some of the things that we need to look at if we really want to get to epidemic preparedness. And I think to me, those are some of the things that we need to look at. And so long as we are in the, this conference and we have biomedical people, no engineers in the room to start understanding, no people from the business schools to package what we are talking about to make business sense. No people from the treasuries of the, the various governments, we are basically singing to ourselves and hoping to make a change. We have to change the way we do business and we market health solutions and strategies for the future. It is not business as usual. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Ogutu. I think that requires a, a, maybe a comment from Caesar, and I think, uh, yes, Louis as well, please. You've said a lot, so I don't think I'll add more about it. I just wanted to go back to the idea that we mentioned about abolitionism, and, you know, it, it, it sounds scary, but it's not that scary. We just need to stop doing things the way we've always done, perhaps take a step back. And when you talk about I mean, uh, decolonization, um, we, all yeah, we all do need to decolonize. Whereas maybe the high-income countries need to de-imperialize 
what is also required, especially from us African intellectuals, I don't know what that means, but that's what we're called, um, is that we need a commitmental involvement of decolonization. Otherwise, let's be careful, and I talk to really my brothers and sisters Africans here, we can be shouting against the dominion of the high-income countries, but we're doing it for ourselves as privileged Africans and not really for our people. And let's learn from the history of the independence movements. We drove away the colonizers only to allow, to go in and take their place and continue doing the same thing. So we need to interrogate ourselves seriously, whose interests we are representing. And I think that is a deep challenge for us as African intellectuals. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. Just really briefly. First of all, I really noted down some of your comments. They were great. I like the notion of the of global health community being narcoleptic. I mean, that's quite, quite good. Uh, I think I just wanted to say something briefly about the concept of marketing, because I think the, um, the point you're making, I think, is really important. I've worked uh, a bit in vaccine confidence and, uh, and vaccine deployment. Um, I think, I, I don't know, and I'm really interested to hear what others think. I think there's a I'd be a bit concerned about calling it marketing because I think it still makes us think of sort of, uh, you know, that we have a product and a process that's already uh, completed and we're bringing it into the communities. And I think that's been the problem. And I think that's been one of the reasons for um, sort of vaccine hesitancy. Um, and I think the interesting thing in the work that we've been doing on vaccine acceptance has been that the discussions we have with people are almost never about the vaccine, at least in, in Sierra Leone where work. Uh, there are about much bigger questions about inequality, about feeling uh, marginalized, about feeling like the process uh, it feels suspicious or feels extractive or exploitative. Uh, and so for me, I think the question is really about how do we, how do we think about the, you know, designing vaccine deployment strategies in ways, in ways that engage communities from the start, um, right? And so whether we're, you know, whether we call it marketing, whether we call it community engagement, I think it's, uh, it's an important Point. Thank you. I think we can take one more question. Um, maybe gentlemen at the end. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, good morning to everyone. I am uh, Dr. Ezekiel Wufa from Cameroon, virologist. Um, I think my question, I will address my question mainly to Dr. Wilber concerning this experience across Africa. I think during your presentation, I heard you talked about uh, the G State platform. And when, uh, when um, citing the countries in Africa that submitted data, I didn't hear about Cameroon because I know we submitted some sequences. So the first part of my question will be, um, because in the world of opinion, from my own perspective, uh, GSA is more or less um, difficult to access and is difficult also to submit sequence in GSA. whereas uh, we have another alternative, uh, I think the NIH database, the, the Los Alamos repository, Gene Bank, which is much more uh, uh, easier, I don't know, Maybe it's uh, on our, the fault is on our point or on our site. I don't know. Could you please explain the procedure first of all to submit to GSAID and also, or maybe you answer to the second part because the second part was actually on, uh, as you said, uh, com uh, um, download, uh, uploading the sequence because I believe there are a lot of data that are being generated but we don't share and maybe the problem could be accessing those uh, 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 repository and database for sequence submission and maybe uh, 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 other data to, to share other data. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, Ezekiel for that uh, question, I think in your question there are a number of uh, issues raised. Uh, first, um, I think Canon did submit, uh, according to my presentation, it's only Eritrea that had zero sequences submitted. Uh, 
Um, so that means other Africans, African countries, uh, did uh, submit uh, sequences. Uh, how the procedure and how difficult it is to submit to GSID, um, according to uh, the website of GSID, they applied themselves as being uh, easy and highly accessible for submission. And um, the fact that many countries were able to submit, they knew that the process is easy. And when you look at their vision and why they were formed, they were trying to overcome the problems of other public databases, uh, which uh, the, the submitters or the, the, the sources of uh, sequences were not being appreciated or recognized. They used a statement called being scooped. You submit a sequence and someone makes use of it and uh, you're never involved in the outcomes or the products uh, of that. So GSAID came up to uh, solve those uh, challenges and I hope they do. And I want to uh, uh, advocate that they do democratize their governance because looking at their scientific advisory board, uh, there's no representation from Africa and South America. So that's not good for a database that is to represent uh, the whole world. And I think maybe going forward, uh, it's good for Africa CDC to develop such a database that does uh, collect such resources for Africa and increases access uh, to scientists within uh, the African continent. Thank you. Uh, yeah, another question. Yes, gentlemen, please. Thank you so much. Um, thank you also for all the speakers for your wide uh, exposure. However, my name is Dr. Mucho Yogisha. I'm a study physician at Rindebuzima, which is a scientific organization which um, conducts clinical trials here in Rwanda. And um, it's a big uh, pleasure for me to be on, uh, to participate into this uh, conference. So my question was for Dr. Lauren. Thank you. Um, as a specialist in social, I would like to know um, what what are action, uh, action plans that can help to prevent uh, those uh, teenager pregnancies because um, we, we think that if you project in the future, probably will be again in a lockdown, either for this uh, known um, a, a pandemic or new one. So. What can be your advice about that? So that was my question, and um, I would like to to thank uh, Professor Caesar for his topic about solidarity in Africa. Uh, I think it's very big uh, solution for us because uh, in the past many Africans used to want a charity. But now we are, we are able because uh, we are fight we are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are going to fight uh, we, we, were, we were fighting against our issue and we were, we were capable to do that. So now if we continue to do uh, solidarity in our research, I think will be one day at the top of the research in Africa to fight uh, against our issue. Why not the world issue? Thank you so much. Thank you. You can hear me, I guess. Um, good question. So we are doing a few things to try and, and untangle that problem. 
we are hoping that the data from the qualitative part of the review will give more of the lived experiences um, and understand what's happened in individual countries and contexts specifically. There's also a um, COVID stringency index, which the University of Oxford have made, that you can map uh, to individual countries and to um, regions within a country. So once we have a full set of data, we're hoping to be able to uh, you know, analyze that in more detail with that stringency index and see across countries uh, of similar income settings or neighbors who had similar policies, what was different there that meant that it did or it did not happen, and then hopefully have some hypothesis or answers. So we're working for Progress, but it is the aim of the project to understand better, not just describe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, I am Dr. Alam from Germany. By profession, I am a virologist, so I always look into bench to bed site. Always, I want to translate my research activities for antiviral drug development into the bed, bed site. I have one question for you. I have uh, gone through one research literature that African populations are much uh, responder uh, for therapeutics as well as for the prophylactics. Is it true? Do you have any kind of a data which can indicate that African populations or African demographic patients have better responding activities than the other populations? Any data? Or maybe, in another word, your innate immunity is far stronger than other populations. I don't have any specific data, but for sure every population or every group with their whole genetic makeup will react or respond differently to different interventions. It might not only be at the level of, um, let me say, trying to boost immunity. We see it across the whole spectrum of different therapeutics, how different groups based on their race, where they're from, the natural environment, how all those are factors in how an individual might respond to a different intervention. And that is part of the rationale on why we need diversity in the different clinical trials. It's so that each population has data about how they react to a particular intervention. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. I'm sorry we'll have to stop. It's only the start of the discussion. I suggest that if you have more questions, you uh, go and speak with our, our brilliant speakers, which we should thank again for really strong uh, presentations and talks. So thank you so much again. Um, a few uh, last thing uh, here, I'm going to thank our donors and then uh, who have supported the coalition, the secretariat, which helps to bring all these brilliant researchers together. We have uh, two hashtags here, uh, not hashtags, um, QR code, <laughs> to, uh, one to uh, become a member if you would like to, and a second one to have a short survey that won't take long of your time. So again, Thank you so much and let's meet next year.